Greetings, everyone, and welcome to tonight's program, Language and Justice. My name is Marcia Eli. I'm the Director of Programs at the Brooklyn Public Library's Center for Brooklyn History. Let me start by inviting you to join me in acknowledging that we are gathered from locations throughout the city on the unceded homeland of the Lenape people. And we pay our respects to this community, their members past and present, as well as all future generations of Lenape people. Brooklyn Public Library acknowledges that it was founded on the intentional exclusions, genocide and erasures of the Lenape. And we are committed to working to dismantle the ongoing legacies and repercussions of settler colonialism. This acknowledgement is only the beginning of our effort. I want to say a, a brief word about how we come to this program tonight. This year, Brooklyn Public Library, along with our partners at New York Public Library, received a grant, an equity in action grant from the Metropolitan New York Library Council to take on the work of replacing our catalog's biased subject heading, illegal alien, with less biased language like undocumented immigrant or non-citizen. And this is just one of the many examples of stigmatizing language that live in library catalogs and in our consciousnesses. And, and one of our goals at BPL and one of the purposes of this grant, as we do the behind the scenes justice work of correcting the descriptions is to bring to a, a wide public a public that does not necessarily live in the world of official Library of Congress classifications, a sense of awareness and a sense of urgency about connecting the dots between stigmatizing language of, cl of classifications, stigmatizing language in media and in general, and the very real and powerful ways these labels dehumanize people. So tonight we have assembled a truly extraordinary cross discipline group of experts to share their work, experiences and perspectives. Before I introduce them, I want to thank the Brooklyn Public Library's Alternative Classification Committee for their critical work and for their steward stewardship of, of this program. I also want to let you all know that the option for closed captioning is available by enabling that function at the bottom of your screen. And I want to invite you to share your questions for our panelists throughout the program tonight. Simply type them into the Q&A box, which is also at the bottom of your screen. So now let me briefly tell you who is behind this digital curtain and invite them to join us. I'll start with Rinku Sen, Executive Director of Narrative Initiative. Rinku is a writer and social justice strategist. She is formerly the Executive Director of Race Forward. Under Sen's leadership, Race Forward generated some of the most impactful racial justice successes of recent years, including Drop the I Word, a campaign for media outlets to stop referring to immigrants as illegal, quote, which resulted in the Associated Press, US Today, LA Times, and many more outlets changing their practice. Her books, Stir It Up and the Accidental American, theorize a model of community organizing that integrates a political analysis of race, gender, class, poverty, sexuality, and other systems. She serves on numerous boards, including the Women's March, where she is co-president. Welcome, Rinku. Thank you. Next, Saul Lopez. Saul has worked in the information description and classification areas of academic libraries for 10 years. In the last four years, Saul has offered several presentations on inclusivity in the library catalog or conscientious cataloging. She currently works for Canopy Inc. as a content and workflow consultant working directly with academic librarians. Hi, Saul, I know you're there. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Chanda Prescott-Weinstein is an assistant professor of physics and astronomy 
and core faculty in women's and gender studies at the University of New Hampshire. The author of The Disordered Cosmos, A Journey into Dark Matter, Space Time and Dream Deferred. She is also a columnist for New Scientist and Physics World. Nature recognized her as one of 10 people who shaped science in 2020. And Essence Magazine has recognized her as one of quote, 15 black women who were paving the way in STEM and breaking barriers, unquote. She received the 2017 LGBT plus physics physicists acknowledgement of excellence award for her contributions to improving conditions for marginalized people in physics and the 2021 American Physical Society Edward A. Bochet award for her contributions to particle cosmology. Hi Chanda. Hi. Otto Santa Ana is Emeritus Professor in the Department of Chicana and Chicano and Central American Studies at UCLA. He has published four books and 50 academic pieces, chiefly on how language is used to validate unjust social inequity using empirical sociolinguistic and critical discourse analytic tools. Much of his scholarship focuses on language that constructs social hierarchies and on how the mass media amplifies the construction of unjust social inequity. He's currently writing a monologue on the fundamental political nature of laughter based on the thesis that humor is both a social formation and disciplinary tool. Thank you for being here, Otto. And finally, our moderator tonight is Brandy Collins Dexter, a senior fellow at the advocacy organization Color of Change and a visiting fellow at the Shorenstein Center on Media Politics and Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. At Color of Change, she led a number of successful campaigns for accountability, including getting Fox's The O'Reilly Factor taken off the air, getting R. Kelly dropped from RCA, pressuring financial companies to pull funding from over 100 hate groups and persuading Disney not to whitewash the features of their character, Princess Tiana. She was one of the prominent leaders involved with persuading Facebook to undergo an unprecedented civil rights audit to address the platform's negative impact on marginalized communities. Her book, Black Skin Head, slated for release in 2022, uses a pop culture lens and draw stories from the oral histories of black potential voters and stakeholders from ages 17 to 108 to understand the history of black political, economic and social power. So welcome all of you. I thank you so much for being here. And Brandy, I, I turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much. I'm excited for this panel. Um, I wanna start us off by uh, telling you two stories, possibly related, possibly not. They both relate to Minner City, Mississippi, an unincorporated county in an unincorporated community in Lafleur County. In the late 1880s, the Southern Farmers Alliance, a populist movement in the region organizing for labor and land rights, had barred black people from membership. And those black farmers organized the Colored Farmers Alliance and Cooperative Union. In September 1889, major American newspapers claimed that hundreds of black people were fighting against white people in Minner City, and there was a potential race war brewing. White lawmakers and officials in the area rushed to say there had been some troublesome blacks that had to be released, arrested, sorry, Negroes. If you're side-eyeing this story right now, you definitely should be. Contemporary black newspapers described the incident as less a race riot and more of an all out massacre. Up to 100 black people were reported to have been killed or disappeared. As one newspaper reported, some people when they returned home denied anyone had been killed. But JC Engel, an agent for a New York textile company was there during the trouble. When he arrived at New Orleans several days later, he told reporters that Negroes were quote unquote shot down like dogs. Members of the posse not only killed people in the swamps, he said, they invaded homes and murdered men, women and children. Engel recalled one act in which a 16 year old white boy, quote, beat the brains out of a little colored girl while a bigger brother with a gun kept the little one's parents off. Whispers told the story of well-known leaders of the Colored Alliance being targeted, shot and killed and that the killings continued long after the media had left. Ultimately, everything was covered up 
and the actual number and names of all the people killed remain unknown. Needless to say, the Black Farmer Populist Alliance would be short-lived. Here's another story, one that starts in the waiting room of a hospital. I was sitting with my father. He had been there all day and the hospital had no room to check him in. It was 2020 after all. Did our family have our own land? I asked him. I was trying to keep him distracted any way I could. So I pushed him for more of our family history. I was starting to find strands of an unknown story and I wanted to know if he knew the story I was learning. No, he said, we never owned anything before my generation. After his death, I confirmed what I was already beginning to learn, that this was not true. In fact, my family had owned 100 acres of land around Minner City in the years following the Civil War. On the land, they had built a school and a church. The farm had been successful in the 1880s, but by the early 1900s, they no longer owned that land. My family never knew what happened to the land because they never knew they had land. Like many of us today, don't know about the black farmers in that region that were massacred for organizing. These could be disconnected stories or they could be intimately related stories, but I'll never know because so much of those stories were erased. The people were erased and we're left with these fractured memories and a broader, more dominant frame of a race riot started by rebellious, angry Negroes. I wanted to start with those two stories because right now as stories of Tulsa and Black Wall Street are injected into our public memory, we are in a race to restore lost history. And much of that is tied to how those stories were told in the first place, whether those stories were told in the first place and whose stories were told in the first place and how. To the extent we are just beginning to understand these hidden histories of Black massacres, we're confined by who has the power of the written word and documentation, and we're forced to read between the lines to translate or find a hidden language and meaning. When I started piecing these histories together, I interviewed somebody from the region, and this is what she told me. I had to leave Lafleur County to find out about Lafleur County, and even now I don't know much. It wasn't like they had it tucked away in our library. No one wanted us to know our history, that we were powerful and brave, and that we once had something. They only wanted us to believe that we always had nothing. And those are the kinds of fights we're up against. Those are the stories why I joined this panel, because I wanted to talk to people who are doing the hard work of fighting to preserve our understanding of history and our futures, to uncover the bias laced within words and the day-to-day -day decisions about how things are labeled and cataloged, how we are labeled and cataloged because usually a race riot isn't just a race riot. And as a country, only, we're only now beginning to grapple with that. So I'm excited now to turn to our panelists who I wanna hear talk. I told you a little bit why I joined this panel from a personal level, but I also joined because these speakers are fire. So I'm gonna back out of the way so we can hear from them. So I wanna start with an open-ended question to a panelist. Thank you for joining us. Uh, here's the big question, why do words matter? And how does this broad conversation about dehumanizing words intersect with your work? And I'd love to kick us off with Rinku. Thank you. It's a thrill to be here and nice to see you, Brandy. It's been a minute. Um, words matter because they kick up mental models in people's brains. So when someone hears race riot, they have a particular image after many years of having the words race riot applied to black people and urban situations, uh, they, they get an immediate image of a black man usually who is um, carting something around. There's a, there's a famous uh, comparative image of two stories that were, that two photos that ran in the Associated Press right after Katrina, there's, um, they're almost exactly the same two people in each uh, frame and they're both wading through water they're both carrying bags and the caption under the picture of the white man says um, a Katrina survivor wades through water with supplies or something like that and the uh, caption under the black people says these are looters carrying like looted supplies through the water um, someone had to write those captions and um, it probably wasn't the same person who wrote the caption for the white photo as wrote the caption for the black photo, but those kinds of word choices have um, make a difference in people's minds. There was, a, um, there was a report that the National Hispanic Media Coalition did 
when we were running Drop the I Word right around the time of the 20, 2012 um, election cycle, where they discovered that 40% of Americans thought that all Latinos were undocumented because all they ever saw was images of Latinos next to the I word. And they came to the conclusion that in fact, not only are Latinos not citizens, but they're all actually here having um, crossed the border without permission. So words matter a lot because they, they kick up images and models and stereotypes and impressions of of the people we're talking about, their characterizations of people. And the other reason that I wanna say they matter is that um, if you, is that beautiful words put together in evocative ways actually make old stories new again. There aren't that many actual new stories. <laughs> um, we're all on a quest for something, equality, uh, justice, a home, clean air and there are obstacles in our way. So reading a version of the same story over and over again, the actual words in use, the, the rhythm of them, the size of them, the familiarity of them, the newness of them, all of that matters in how someone uh, reads or receives a story. Those are, those are the things that are important to me. Thank you. Uh, Otto, let's hear from you on that. What are your thoughts and what brought you to this panel? Well, I was fascinated to hear that people were focused on uh, language. I'm a linguist and I've always been interested in language since the very beginning. Uh, the reason that I'm a linguist is because uh, by the time I was, I, I spoke Spanish and English as a child. Uh, I went to school then as a kindergarten, I lost my Spanish within about six months and uh, couldn't speak to my tias and my abuelita all of a sudden and uh, struggled against that, but couldn't. And it took, uh, it became the worm that gnawed at me all my life uh, because it opens, languages open up your way of understanding the world. It opens you up and keeps you connected to the world. But I also learned that it structures the way we understand the world. It is the vehicle by which we understand the world. So I'm piggybacking on Rinku's absolutely on the mark, it kicks up images. The metaphors that we use, we have found out in cognitive science over the last 20 years, structure the way that all humankind understands their world. We take these guiding metaphors that, and we build narratives that we repeat. Rinku had it right on the mark again because she talked about stories. All the the hegemonic stories that guide our society in the wrong way and in the right way are understood by us via the discourses that we develop in different institutions. And so I was, ex I was drawn to the fact that it was the a library who was interested in looking at the uh, uh, recataloging and relabeling the terms which structure the way we think as scholars which teach us as children how to think about our world. And the fact that it was students, as it always is, who uh, led the charge to change what was taken as normal by the adults, by the elders, and to question and interrogate uh, concepts that were discriminatory and just false. So I'm very happy to be part of this. And I want to shout out to Rinku because she uh, led a tremendous charge with the Drop the Eye uh, uh, campaign, which was so powerful uh, about 10 years ago. Thank you. Yes, I'm definitely going to hit you up about that, Pinku. But um, it's all talk to me. Why did you join this um, panel? And what does your work look like? And why do words matter? Can you repeat the question, please? Why do words matter? And what brought you specifically to join this panel? Thank you. Um, words matter because um, just in listening to um, Otto uh, talk about his uh, background and his upbringing, I had, I share a similar upbringing growing up in the border of El Paso and Juarez. 
being bilingual and um you know my uh parents um are immigrants as well and when i came across the story of the uh, college students at dartmouth who had worked with their librarians to bring about change uh, when they came across uh, an instance of the I word in their library catalog. I felt very, I felt a whirlwind of emotions. And I also remember thinking as a cataloger working in an academic library, what am I, what are my capabilities? How can I think outside the box? And they did a, an outstanding job documenting uh, using the work of the Drop the I uh, Word campaign. Um, and I was just blown away. And I felt very strongly that because we had the documentation at the time, um, I felt empowered and I had approval from uh, the Dean of the Library um, in Colorado where I was working at the time to um, implement these changes. And what I did there was um, remove every instance that contained the I word in our library catalog and replace it with uh, undocumented immigrants and uh, other variants that the students uh, at Dartmouth and the librarians at Dartmouth had proposed. Um, when I did that, I made sure that I uh, gave presentations to my colleagues and libraries. Um, I ended up going to another um, academic library in Colorado where I implemented the same change. Um, and I can say that words matter because in my, in my vision, I, I could see, you know, we serve in libraries, we serve a lot of undocumented um, um, customers and I just did not want to be in a position where I sat back and did nothing um, and that's how strongly I felt about terminology that we use to organize and describe information. Great and Chanda same question. Yeah, to, just to start with, why am I here? I'll be honest and say I'm Brooklyn on both sides of my family. And so anything involving the Brooklyn Public Library, I'm probably gonna say yes to, um, especially librarians. I grew up in East LA, but I'm Brooklyn on both sides. Um, and, and you know, on a, on a deeper level, I'm, I'm a first time author. My book just came out in March. And one of the things that happens when you're uh, putting a book out is that it gets sent to the Library of Congress to receive subject headers um, and, and to be uh, categorized. And the way this works, as I understand it, is it goes off to the Library of Congress with some recommendations from your publisher. The librarians look at it, they send it back with, some, with what they've decided. Um, so my book, The Disordered Cosmos, A Journey into Dark Matter, Space, Time, and Dreams Deferred, is a popular science book that takes a holistic look at the doing of physics. I'm a particle physicist uh, by training and by practice. And I'm also a black feminist theorist. And so the, the book places a black feminist theory lens on, on the doing of physics. And so my book was returned from the Library of Congress with a subject header um, that included African-American biography um, and did not include particle physics. And um, so I, I went to my publisher and said, we, I, I can't have this in my book. <laughs> it's not a biography. And they said, okay, well, we have one appeal. They appealed, the appeal was rejected. And so they said to me, our only option is we can choose not to print these subject headers on the copyright page, but this is how it's gonna be classified. This is how libraries are going to see it. Um, so the reason I'm telling the story is as an author, I felt powerless. Um, these people at the Library of Congress had made a decision. They had made a decision about classifying me and um, really a book that is 20 years of thought from me um, in a particular way. And you can see my body language. I still feel it, right? Um, and so I did the only thing that I could do. I have a sizable Twitter following. I jumped on Twitter and was like, hey, 
the Librarian of Congress is a Black woman. Maybe she and I can talk about what it means to do this to the first Black woman to hold a faculty position in theoretical cosmology. What does it mean to do this to the first Black woman to publish a popular science book on physics? And the, the Twitter thread took off. Um, and I was also texting it to like my friends who are archivists and asking them to post it in their Facebook groups. And eventually someone from the Library of Congress saw it and we had an email exchange and the subject headers were changed. And, and I'm, but you know, let's say I only had 500 Twitter followers. The story has a very different ending. Maybe I'm not even on this panel talking about it. Um, so in, in some sense, that's why I'm here. And, and you know, that, that story also tells us so much about the power of words that you get classed in a particular way. And then that tells a particular story. Whereas I'm sitting here next to a copy of The Sirens of Mars, Searching for Life on Another World by Sarah Stewart. And it's a book about um, this another scientist's journey with her science. And in the book description, it has biographical details about her childhood. Um, my book doesn't have any biographical details about my childhood in, in, in the description. Her book was classified as being about Mars and life on Mars, right? And, and so I, I also, I'm highlighting her in particular because I want to be clear that this is not just a gendered thing, but it is a racialized thing. Um, the last you know, couple of comments that I want to make about language is something that I talk about in the book. I'm a dark matter expert. I spend all day on dark matter. It's what I did today before um, I came here. Um, I talk about the fact that the, us calling it dark matter actually gives the public a wrong impression of what dark matter is, which is actually that it's invisible or transparent. And dark also evokes very different things for us, depending on whether we come from a community where we talk about skin color, or if we come from a community where um, we don't think of people with color in their skin as people, right? That that word dark takes on very different meanings. And um, so one of the things that I challenge in the book is the misunderstandings that this has created, even in how dark matter then gets deployed as an analogy, for example, in Black studies. Um, so these words really have power in even the naming of these things that supposedly have nothing to do with race and have nothing to do with earth and have nothing to do with people. Um, so that's one of the, the things that, that drew me here. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited to be in conversation with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Ringo, I want to come back to you because a couple of folks have named Chad, dropped the I word, which I know you were doing a lot of incredible work around, but some of our folks may not uh, know a lot about that campaign. So can you talk to us about it and, and what it took to win? Sure. Um, we started the Drop the I Word campaign because uh, we could see that the repetitive use of the phrase illegal immigrant and its variations had had a horrible effect on the policy debate around immigration and immigrants. Um, in, it became really uh, kind of used a lot at, uh, after 9-11, when, uh, when immigration conservatives, the anti-immigrant right wing, really pushed it. It was one of their um, uh, big tactical points because in fact, after 9-11 and before 9-11, Americans didn't actually feel like immigration was a problem. We had just in the mid 80s had a big legalization of undocumented people. It was fine. The 90s were good. Um, and and the, the conservatives were mad about that because they wanted to think about ways to limit immigration, um, but Americans were not cooperating. And what they decided, um, if, you know, if you've heard the name Frank Luntz, Frank Luntz is a Republican um, communication strategist. He writes for the GOP, the words that work memos. And there is a words that work memo about immigration that he produced in the early 2000s that said, uh, Americans aren't worried about immigration, but they love law and order. They're very law abiding. So what you need to do is attach immigrants to law and order in a negative way. And the way you're gonna do that is by repeating illegal immigrant everywhere and making the press do it too. I remember doing an interview with um, 
a leader at the Federation for American Immigration Reform, conservative organization. And at the beginning of my interview, he said, I insist that you use the words illegal immigrant. Don't put it, don't like try to sugarcoat it. And I said, um, if you use those words and I quote you, I will quote you accurately, but you can't tell me what to write my story. Gosh, um, how do you think you have that kind of power? So there was a concentrated effort among immigration restrictionists to make those words and that idea and the mental models that, that attach to it ubiquitous to make them everywhere so that you couldn't turn around and not see them. And one big effect of that was, was on non-immigrants, but there was also a big effect on immigrants and on undocumented immigrants. I spoke to people who said, uh, after we won, who said, I can't tell you what a huge difference it makes in my mental health and my life and my ability to keep going to not see that word in every newspaper article about immigration that I open up. So um, I think the lessons here for us is that if you want to make, if you want to change the standards for language, like um, and, and pull it up out of a subculture and make that new standard, that new language mainstream. The process is of organizing around it. That's such a great story um, to hear about your book, Chanda, because uh, that's what it takes. It takes like not doing it by yourself, getting together with your friends, making a stink, a collective stink. And people had tried on the I word before we did. And I think we only succeeded because we had done a really tight power analysis because there were enough immigrants in the country now mad about it that we could actually build a constituency. It wasn't the same constituency in the 80s when people tried to do it. We, you know, by the 2010s, we had Latino reporters in newsrooms who were challenging their editors about the use of the word. But nobody was going to win big unless the Associated Press changed their style guide, because the AP is the most powerful media organization in the world setting style. So our power analysis told us if we want it done, they have to do it first, because once they do it, everybody else will follow. And that turned out to be true, except for at the New York Times and the Washington Post. Um, they still they still need pressure. So um, part of doing this work of changing what people think by telling them new kinds of stories is to understand the systems at play, to, um, to be able to break down and figure out who inside these systems is responsible for the situation being the way it is and who could change it and um, whose power would they respond to. So librarians attacking the Library of Congress for the way they classify something, that is gonna be persuasive to the Library of Congress because librarians are their constituency. Um, not so much at the AP. If we had taken librarians to the AP, they would have been like, uh, we don't care. But what we took to them was uh, human rights lawyers, um, immigration attorneys, actual undocumented people and their stories, people who were not undocumented, but um, suffered the discrimination of having the image applied to them. And over time they changed and they were along with us, there were the disability rights community was, was the AP was under pressure from multiple organized constituencies at that stage. And, um, and I'm so glad we won that because the Trump years would have been extra miserable if, um, if they had like reverted to their old policy. Um, so I think those are the, the big points. You, you, treat it, you treat the language change like an organizer would change any other thing that they wanted to um, address uh, by doing a power analysis, by organizing a constituency, and then by driving the assets that your constituency has through the vulnerabilities that the, um, the system has. Uh, it took us two and a half years. I thought we were gonna lose and I was just starting to make exit plans. Like we declare victory on what we got and we wrap it up because no one had put a dime of money into the campaign. So um, 
there was only so long we were going to be able to sustain it. And luckily, just before I managed to make that plan, the AP uh, changed their policy and we won. Yeah. Well, you um, bless you for that. Thank you. Um, sparkles to that work. Uh, you threw a little bit out there about library and organizing, which I'm going to um, come come back to Solemn, but there was a question in the queue that Otto has your name on it, I think. And that's what's the relationship between decolonization and language justice? Um, do you wanna put a little bit on that? Okay. Um, Decolonization is a large um, uh, project that involves uh, taking the uh, so-called Western world, restructuring it in a sense, in a holistic way to take and address all the features that we've come in the Americas, for example, to accept as, uh, as appropriate as normal, the institutions that have kept down people of color, immigrants, uh, women in particular, um, all those aspects need to be questioned and interrogated. Uh, that's a very, very large social project. Um, just consider the, the name of uh, many of the cities, in states and countries of uh, North and South America, to mention America. There's a tremendous amount of work there. One aspect of it is uh, the language justice. And this is what our focus is today, at looking at the language which guides our thinking. Uh, a, a bit later, I can talk a little bit about uh, the cognitive aspects, the thinking that goes, uh, why we as a people, why, why as a species, we think uh, via language. And I wanna uh, touch back to uh, Chanda's very important notion about uh, dark matter, which is always scratched, uh, made me scratch my head, I'm gonna do it now, but it's made me scratch my head uh, to, uh, because it, it, the conjuring, the, the implications, the responses that we take uh, to the terms, to the language, matter significantly. That's why the work that, uh, that librarians in, uh, who are activists do is so important because uh, language for me and language uh, for cognitive science is key to making change in our world. Thank you. That was a perfect cue up for Saul. I wanna come back to you because you've talked a bit about, you talk a lot about radical cataloging and, and the work that um, librarians have and can do to organize. And you, you touched on that at the beginning, but could you drill a little deeper on what, what, what is radical cataloging and what does that work look like for you? Sure, um, so I have, um, a definition from a paper that I have used in my past presentations on radical cataloging. Other terms uh, used that are similar are um, conscientious cataloging. Um, and radical cataloging seeks to give a voice to people and concepts that are difficult to access through library subject searches. So it's a very straightforward uh, definition and um, the way that I interpret it is, you know, it's basically thinking outside of the box, um, deviating a little bit from the very strict library information organization and classification standards uh, that we use. Uh, many of these do come directly from the Library of Congress, uh, which has been around since 1800. Um, so it's a long, long time, uh, decades and decades of libraries following the Library of Congress's lead, their initiatives, and rightly so. I mean, they are an incredible institution with so much power. But I will say that uh, many of these cataloging standards that are used 
are known to be very restrictive, um, very rigid. And this creates problems. Um, and so with radical cataloging, um, you know, we as catalogers talk about something called uh, catalogers judgment. Sometimes you do have a little bit of flexibility when you're describing an information resource. Um, but it's very, it's very minimal, usually. And um, radical cataloging is, you know, potentially using um, specific uh, subject headings that may not be authorized by the Li Library of Congress or another institution and inserting that into a library uh, cataloging record. Um, so that is that is the best way that I can I can uh, uh, talk about radical cataloging. Um, it's been um, something that I wanted to mention is that in 2019 there was a survey that was sent out to many types of libraries to assess um, you know who was uh, implementing the uh, alternative subject headings for the iWord into their catalogs, and uh, what we received was um, about 40 uh, libraries uh, self-identified. They uh, talked about the different processes to be used. Um, you know, every library has a different um, library system. And so your ability to uh, complete a, a project like this, um, you know, um, differs depending on, on which library system you have. And so all of this information was documented and, um, it's been a, a very inspiring, uh, definitely, to see um, the library community be so involved um, with these types of changes, uh, making sure that you know, we're not so restricted by these um, uh, restrictive uh, uh, cataloging standards, which uh, have, have evolved, especially as we um, are leaning more uh, towards the digital environment. Um, but even, even with that, there's still a lot of work to do. I know that um, in the most recent um, American Library Association annual conference that we had this year, um, there are uh, libraries that are still putting pressure to the Library of Congress to make sure that their processes for uh, implementing um, updates becomes more transparent. Um, and so that is that is something that I wanted to make make sure that I mentioned here. Thank you. And as a reminder to folks, um, we do have Q&A coming up. So I see a lot of folks on there. If you have some questions, please drop them in. Um, Chanda, I wanna come back to you because the, you know there's a little more to this story um, and, and the things that you had to work through. and even some of these issues that are being raised about subject headings um, and the challenges for you as an author. What are, talk to us a little more about the experience and, and what are some of the broader issues that folks need to pay attention to that's going on right now? So I, I, I need to start, I think, by setting the scene here, um, which is at the end of my book, there's a recommended reading list and I have like a little preamble to it, which ends, um, Many of these books and articles can be found through your local library. If they aren't available, let me just say that librarians and archivists are often the very, very best of humanity. This book wouldn't exist without them. And I bet they'd be help, happy to help you get your hands on the book or article you're looking for. Um, and I, I wrote that before this discussion about the subject headings happened, to be clear. And so actually that was, I want to be clear that that was part of my heart heard about it really was that I had put this love note to librarians into the book. And then like, you know, I, I was having, I was having this tangle with them. Um, you know, it was, a, it was a learning experience for me in the sense that, you know, first of all, this question of why was it called African-American biography is black biography an option. Um, and that it's actually not that simple to change the names of subject headers. And, and so I think that that's something that's worth just saying out loud, um, that for Library of Congress to make changes like that actually involves Congress. Um, so that's, that's step one, which is that I, 
I was raised in a house, we didn't say African American, we said black. And so for me, even if this had been a biography, it might have felt a little bit foreign for, for me for, for that reason alone. Um, but then, you know, have, you know, it's Twitter, right? So people come in your mentions, they talk to you about like, and, and, and I had a lot of white librarians come into my mentions to explain to me like what, what were the librarians intentions here. Um, and one thing that I heard a lot of was they were probably trying to make sure that black people saw your book. Um, and I think that this is, for me, this really raised like, I heard that in the sense that like, um, maybe the book doesn't get put in a place where um, librarians, white librarians in particular maybe, will encourage like black like teenagers to go or young adults to go unless it's the black section. Um, and I just wanna be clear, like, you know, this is the cover of the book. I was real intentional about like who I wanted to, to see in the book and who I wanted to see themselves in the book. Um, so I think that there was also this issue of what does it mean to connect, for example, Black readers with Black books in spaces where maybe the librarians are all white and most of the patrons are white? And also, what does it mean to connect, you know, more broadly, people of color with books that reflect the world that they are living in? Like, again, coming from Los Angeles, that means a lot of different types of people. Um, when you know, in some sense, like our catalogs were developed, I mean, they're antebellum uh, in, in some sense, they they're, they're rooted in, in a different time. So I think for me, it was really informative. And I, you know, just to, to pull it back a little bit, at the time that this was all happening, I was in the middle of hiring research assistants for an archival project that's actually underway right now, um, which is that I have um, two incredible, um, women students working with me right now that are creating uh, what will be a public bibliography of all of the papers published by Black American women with PhDs in physics. Um, and this will eventually be made publicly available, uh, fingers crossed, sometime in the next six months. And this is based on a, a, a list that's compiled by Jamie Valentine Miller at the African American Women in Physics website. So I encourage people to go to aawip.com. And um, there were about 100 people on the list. And one of the interesting things about the work that Jamie has had to do, Dr. Dr. Valentine Miller has had to do in putting that list together is decisions about who goes on it who's classified as a physicist, what counts as astronomy, what counts as planetary science, where's geophysics, where's geology, um, and how does our relationship with being Black women and gender minorities in these fields where we are highly marginalized shape our relationship to wanting to be classified as one of those words. Um, and of course, that's one of the conversations I've had with, with the RAs who are working with me is that we are now making decisions in using that list and the decisions that were made for that list, we are now reifying those linguistic choices um, and in, in ways that maybe we don't even necessarily, like I have questions about some of the things, Jamie and I have dialogues about, you know, what's, what's on the list and what's not on the list. And so I, I think it's also valuable to say that you know, it's not just words shape how we think through the world, but words shape how we think through ourselves. Um, and, and how, like, you know, even do I call myself a theoretical physicist or an astrophysicist? It actually locates me differently in relationship to my experiences of marginalization in these communities. Um, and I, I, so I think that that's a really important thing to raise up. And it is an archival question because at some point we're doing history, we're categorizing, we're locating people socially. Um, you know, the, the one other thing that I wanna bring up in, in relation to the book, and then I promise I'll, I'll stop talking about it so much, um, is one of the other linguistic issues that I bring up in the book is the phrase colored physics, which comes up a lot in quantum chromodynamics, which is specifically the area of particle physics where my pet dark matter particle comes from. And so I occasionally read papers that say colored physics. Um, and, and again, that sounds different to me <laughs> than it sounds to a lot of my white peers. 
Um, similarly, because we have this dark matter thing, sometimes people like to do thought experiments, like imagine a dark physicist. And I actually had to write to the authors of that paper who were friends of mine and say, there are actual dark physicists. I know I'm a light skinned woman, um, but they're actual like dark skinned physicists. We don't need to imagine them. They're not made of a mysterious invisible matter we've never seen. They are people who are made of the same baryons as you. Um, so again, I think that part of my interest in this is how we as a languaging species and as a storytelling species, Homo narrans, as Sylvia Winter has put it, are given the language to self-articulate, self-construct ourselves as, as, say, Black women physicists, as the case may be. Um, and then also the tension there of other people locating us. And librarians and archivists have a lot of power there. And I think that we're not aware of the role sometimes that librarians and archivists are playing in that process. Yeah, I um, honestly that that hit me a way, especially as somebody who deals with things like imposter syndrome, and and so the way that you framed that really hit home for me, and it made me think of Otto, um, because I know you've talked about and and thought thought about the cognitive aspects of language, and I, I see you nodding in the in the corner, and I I feel like you have something to add to this, so I'd love to hear what you have to say. Uh, so you'd like me to talk about the cognitive aspects of, of language. Is that the question? I'm quite, I... Yes. Okay. Or you can answer whichever question you is sitting with you right now in this conversation. Uh, What's actually, going I was writing a note and... Um, yeah, yeah. And because Chanda's, uh, again, uh, blew my mind to think about um, colored, colored physics. I had, uh, well... So why do people, I mean, what about language? How does, uh, um, for about 30 years, people have been looking seriously using neurological studies, uh, testing with um, uh, 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 very sophisticated psychological, physiological uh, apparatuses to judge and evaluate how we use language and what it means. There was, there's this great idea that people believe Oh, you know the brain is um, the brain is a computer, and the body is the vessel. That sort of dualism that goes way back. Uh, or there's a left brain, right brain sort of thing. That isn't the case for us. Our emotions and our rationality are woven together in our bodies. So we are, we are an embodied thinking creature. And what that means is that our eyes and all our senses led us to understand the world. And so metaphor turned out to be a visual and also non-visual uh, way by which we make sense of the world. We don't think about the world in logic. We don't think about mathematics. If you talk to a mathematician or a physicist about some particle that's special, the, it's, um, there is it, the technology, the, um, Formulations may be very formal, but the language that's used to teach and to understand and to speak about it and discuss it are gonna be inherently in our bodies. There's no, logic is out. And so we have to understand that we organize all of our world from the physicists to the, uh, the uh, kids running down the block in terms of the language we use and the metaphors that we use. Just think about the term love. That's one of the mo may, most important things in our lives. There's only three metaphors in English that constitute the metaphors for love. It's love as a physical force. I could feel the electricity between us. Uh, love is madness. I'm crazy about my wife. Or uh, love is war. Uh, she fought up, she fought him off, uh, and he fed, fled from her advances. Okay? All of our understanding of love in English are based on those three metaphors. In Navajo, there's entirely different Navajo, uh, metaphors. In Korean, there's entirely different metaphors. 
And yet we understand the world in terms of those metaphors. They're conventionalized. We learn them as we grow up speaking the language and they are not natural. It sounds so exotic, so beautiful, so romantic, so poetic to talk the way, to, to translate a Korean casual issue about love. They, uh, in, in Korean, uh, natural phenomena are aspects of love. So they'd say the love of your mother is as deep as the ocean. That's like saying, you know, he digs you. It's not, it's not profound. It's just conventional. And yet we take those concepts, those conventional concepts that we use so often that we think that they are natural. And that's the real problem because uh, conservatives, people who are unwilling to change their understanding about the world, and that includes scientists and institutions, uh, believe and have a sense that this is something natural. Uh, and, and these things really, really matter. I wanted to point out that they did some studies. Uh, for example, um, let's see if I can find it, yeah. So if you take a word and you put, a, a, and you flash it in, in front of people's eyes, and it's a positive word, uh, and you flash it with a white light beforehand and a, a less bright light after, uh, in a second, run, the people respond more quickly to a, a positive affect word before a white light, a bright light. If it's a negative affect term, such as hate or sadness, they respond more quickly if it's, if it's a dark uh, light, a lower colored light than a bright light. So we respond physiologically to the language we use. We even respond to physical things. So if you meet somebody and you're holding a warm uh, cup of coffee, your chances are, and this has been tested, that you're gonna be more warm to that person. If you're holding a cold Coke or a soft drink, you're gonna be, take a, a, it, it's statistically demonstrated that you respond more coolly to that person, more uh, emotionally distant. So these things absolutely matter. And, and so if we think about how scientists, which scientists are no different than anyone else, we and librarians have been doing, following the scientists lead and working within the structures of formalized science, formalized knowledge, institutional knowledge, they build these concepts that are based on fundamentally emotions. It's very difficult to change them and we, we should have means to change them. Immigrant was, my work uh, 20 years ago was on immigrants. And although uh, Riku said it was a great time in the 90s, actually uh, in the 90s, in 1993, there was Proposition 187, which was the anti-immigrant referendum that uh, the uh, racist uh, California governor pushed. And it won overwhelmingly because it simply said, immigrants were taking advantage of, Cal of California's wealth. It was at the end of the Cold War, the economy crashed because our society was built around military uh, production. And when there was no more bombs to drop or no more tanks to build for the Cold War, um, the whole national economy collapsed. The terms that I found that immigrants were being referred to because they were being scapegoated the primary one was immigrants are animals. Out of 100 articles, I found it 87 times in the Los Angeles Times. I looked over seven years. Um, the second one was uh, immigrants are soldiers. The terms were used not only by the, the people who were uh, promoting anti-immigrant, uh, the anti-immigrant referendum, but also by Latino organizations. I went and talked to the UFW and said, you cannot be using these animal terms. And then within one weekend, they changed all their language because it was actually two people that were running the whole thing. But it is so important to recognize 
the change from immigrants to uh, immigrants as animals went as just as Riku said uh, in the mid 90s. I'm sorry, in the mid uh, 2000s, when people started looking at, for another term which wasn't so racist because there was so much attacks, so it was so obvious that immigrants were should not be considered animals. They looked for another terminology, and that's when they went to the notion of immigrant as criminal. And the term illegal immigrant blossomed. It was picked up again by uh, the media, by politicians on the left and the right. And it took the I word campaign to actually push back in a very significant way. This is the challenge that we have. We are talking about something which we grow up understanding. We rarely pay attention to the language we use. And yet it has profound, profound consequences for the way we think about the world. So this language justice approach uh, piece of the decolonization of our society is very crucial because it, it opens up our ways of thinking. It interrogates the specific issues one by one and it allows children to think about new ways of understanding their world, more accurate ways of looking at the world. The notion of dark matter, that's absolutely, you can understand how in, this, in that context that cognitively we are predisposed to take a negative anxiety ridden sort of approach to dark matter when it's invisible matter, right? That's what's so astonishing. And colored physics, you don't even begin to talk to me about that because that just is amazing to think about. Yet it does take institutional effort to work against the challenges that we, uh, the challenge because just when Trump came on board, the I word popped up again in all public media and all the efforts of the AP uh, uh, change went to naught. It ended because people were so eager to respond to a, 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 something that they'd grown up with. Elders who had always been ang anxious to, uh, about immigrants were more likely to revert to a terminology, both of animal and immigrant as criminal. This is crucial. It, it's something that is not going to be changed by uh, codification. It takes a great deal of energy. It's going to take a generation. Thank you. That was beautiful. Um, I want to come back to you, Sol. This question of if you were to imagine a library with language justice, what is like? What does that look like? The life to you? I did see that question come through the chat, and I think it's a great question. Um, We know we are aware of problematic language, problematic subject headings that are unfortunately authorized. And by authorized, I mean that they are uh, controlled. Uh, they are part of a controlled vocabulary, which allows in the um, accessibility of information and collocation of information. And I think that we already know that many libraries are passionate about bringing uh, social justice um, issues into practice. And what I was going to say is making sure that libraries action on alternative vocabularies to better describe uh, populations, especially when we are talking about people. Um, anybody that is uh, falls in the underrepresented uh, population, making sure that those terms that we currently use and are authorized are analyzed. And um, and I can't wait to um, read more about the Brooklyn, Brooklyn uh, Public Library and what you're doing um, with your task force and your committee work. I think it's very exciting. I, I do know that um, you know there's many other libraries that have similar um, task forces. 
the other thing that I wanted to touch on is that we need to definitely focus as libraries, we need to focus on increasing um, representation in uh, the library workforce. And we are aware of that. And there are, you know, projects, there are grants, um, but I feel like, at least from my perspective and my personal experience, um, we need to make sure that people that do come from an underrepresented um, background are given a seat at the table, um, that they are invited um, to discuss administrative topics, leadership, um, making sure that we are inviting them to have a voice. So in the case of libraries, it's not so much about the work that we are doing with uh, organization and classification. It's also who we are hiring, who we are training, and making sure that we have a well-represented uh, workforce. I think that is just as impactful. Yeah, 100%. My um, husband actually comes from a family of multi-generation librarians, and I was stunned to find out that something like 80% of librarians are white women. I was like, wow, okay. Um, so definitely <laughs> we need to be having that conversation for sure. And Rico, I also know that you talk a lot about um, this diversity question matters. We have to talk about diversifying language, newsrooms and libraries. And we also have to talk about what it means to uh, and not just stop at the question of, of diversity. Um, so what does it mean for you to organize for justice and media and knowledge management? Um, in a way that like talks about diversity and beyond. Yeah, um, I consider my work over the last 30 years to have been about racial justice. When people call me to do diversity something or other, I say, I don't do that. You probably want some, someone else, someone different. Um, really simply put, I think of diversity as a matter of numbers. You can have a library or a social space or a workplace that has different kinds of people in it, but they are segregated. Um, diversity doesn't necessarily mean that they have a relationship, that those relationships are um, equal in some way or equalizing. So diversity is about number, numbers. Equity or justice are gonna be about power. So you have all these different people together in the institution, what, how is the power distributed? Um, who has rhetorical power and who doesn't? Who has decision-making power and who doesn't? So um, uh, if you talk to me about anything, I'm gonna talk a lot about power because that is what you have to build to change things. So um, if you're running an institution, then I would encourage you to think not just about our numbers of people coming in who need to be coming in. It's not an irrelevant question, but you wanna go past that question to how are people engaging in our work? How are, um, how are people taking leadership roles in the institution? I've started thinking a lot about library boards actually, because I read a story about a town where um, conservatives like got themselves appointed or elected to the library board. And now they're trying to kill the library by destroying its budget. So maybe there's civic action to be taken at the level of the library board that can help our communities build power. Um, so uh, diversity is necessary, but not enough. And um, the distribution of power and resources in any given setting is what you really, really want to pay attention to. Great, thank you. Um, I ooh, y'all just stacked these <laughs> questions up. Okay. Um, I'm so sorry, Brandy. Can I say one other thing that's yes, related so to the question of what what would a just a language just world look like? Yes, we yes. have to get control of the systems of production and distribution of ideas, books, content. Um, it'll be hard to exercise 
our power if we don't control any of the means of production. I, I know I'm, I'm just channeling Marx right now, but um, it's not gonna be enough for us to be writing books, to be organizing around books, to be promoting books. Um, we have to own some book imprints, uh, people who think like us. We need to own some TV stations. We don't have a Newsbacks, ONA and Fox to like spread all our stuff out through, but we should. So thinking in terms of uh, means of production and owning those, uh, that would also change our power discussion and our discussion about diversity a lot. For sure. Thank you. Um, going to the queue. So, um, so another question. Um, as a cataloger, do you think it is possible to combine ideas of radical cataloging with the concept of standardization of bibli bibliographic description and its benefits? Mainly asking about sharing cataloging and metadata preservation. Whew, you're going to have to break that down a little bit for me as a lay person. Um, that is actually a great question. Um, so the benefit of uh, having standards and standardizing is, um, you know, there's just so much information, you know, we need to have some level of control over how we do things, how we classify things, describe them. And I do think it's possible, and here's a great example. Um, there is a way a website right now that was built to provide uh, terminology that is used to describe um, words that are relevant to our LGBTQ community. And that website is called um, uh, Homosaurus. Homosaurus. And for the first time ever, I recently looked at a catalog record that had a term from, from this uh, resource. Um, and it was, it appeared in the record uh, as, a, as a controlled vocabulary. It identified where it came from. And so I do know that it is possible. I also know that it, it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of people. Um, and I'm hoping that this, you know, I, I, I'm hoping that I did uh, break down <laughs> uh, some of the components for this question, um, but I have seen it. I have seen it happen. And it's just a matter of, you know, finding people that are passionate about this um, and putting something together and then proposing it to stakeholders. Um, but it is a definitely a, a possibility. I feel like right now we're kind of not, we're not there yet fully, um, but we're certainly seeing a lot of uh, uh, different types of activities that, that would allow for um, radical cataloging to happen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Chanda, I wanna come back to you. Um, We've talked about language and, and language injustice um, and how these things play out, but it's, it's also important to talk about spokespeople and, and how that shapes even like our understanding of who are experts, who holds the knowledge, you know, how issues get framed up, how people are talked about. So can you talk a little more about um, maybe your experience in the realm of spokespeople and how black women, gender expansive, non-binary, trans folks, scientists of color, um, those with disabilities are positioned in the media or not? Yeah, this is one I have a lot of feelings about. So I'll try and I'll try and keep it contained. Um, you know, obviously like, you know, the first thing, so I, I feel like here it's probably relevant to, to share a little bit about my CV which is I'm from East LA, I'm Brooklyn on both sides. I also went to Harvard for college. I was the kind of student who was able to get into Harvard. Um, and that means that in some ways the path was open for me in ways that it wasn't open for other people. Um, and it is also the case that though I have, um, because my last name is Prescott Weinstein, um, and therefore have 
interesting experiences with white Jews trying to socially locate me. Like I go to scientific visits and people want to know which of my parents is Jewish so they can decide if I'm one of them or if I'm not. And of course, this doesn't happen to white Jews, right? Um, but I think I am more readily received because of my appearance. This is really relevant to the question of spokespeople um, because I actually think that I'm, you know, in some ways, I am currently leading the life of a highly successful token. And that's not to say that I have not worked hard. That is not to put down my accomplishments, the, the struggles that I have been through. Um, but it is also the case that ICE is still kidnapping people off the street where I grew up and me being a professor at the University of New Hampshire and having a book that's like selling okay doesn't change the fact that ICE has been kidnapping people off the street like the entire time that I've been off thinking about dark matter. Um, and so I think that this is a really important thing to think about when we talk about first, when we talk about like who we, we represent in the media, um, when we talk about what does it mean for those people to even make an appearance in the media. Um, and, and I think the thing that I wanna bring up here is Charlie Bolden's comments. Um, so Charlie Bolden was the NASA administrator under President Barack Obama, and he's a black man, he was an astronaut. Um, he, um, yeah, um, I don't even remember what day of the week it is, when Jeff Bezos rode his thing into space, um, or to the edge of space, let's say, uh, if we're being generous. Um, Charlie Bolden said that some black kid who has witnessed this is now going to be inspired and maybe won't go stand on a street corner with a gun. And I'm, I was so angry about that I cried. Having grown up in a community where people have guns and knowing why the underground economy is the way that people are forced um, into these underground economies, in part because of the, the, the way that undocumented people have to navigate that. Coming from East LA, which for people who don't know, it's a primarily um, Mexican American, Central American, and, and also immigrant community. Um, so when we talk about um, the languaging around representation, and what we are doing when we talk about, like when we use that word, when we deploy it, I think we need to think about, um, sure, Charlie Bolden's a black man. I'm not questioning, he's been through some stuff. He's a bar barrier breaker, he has achieved, but also is he representing the politics of liberation for my community when he's on television making those comments? Not particularly. Um, and similarly, you know, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson has been held up for a really long time as like the black science representative. Um, and not only has he been publicly accused of multiple instances of sexual misconduct and transgression, um, but he also has a habit of saying like disrespectful things about indigenous people in Central America. He made a really nasty comment about the Mayan calendar and why that might explain why the Mayans don't exist anymore. Whereas like, I'm sure everybody else on this panel is fully aware, one of our crises with immigration right now is finding enough translators who speak Mayan languages um, to help people at the border, right? Um, so I guess I, 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 wanna, I wanna encourage people since we're thinking about language to really think about representation and what we're doing when we ask someone to be a representative um, but also to say scientists are also languaging beings like everybody else um, and they're making choices. We are making choices about um, the, the world as how we will articulate it for people. And when scientists are making those languaging choices, they carry a particular power um, because of the way that the intellectual hierarchy is set up in our society. And in particular, physicists are considered kind of like the cream of the crop. And then theoretical physicists are like at the top of the cream of the crop. Um, for, that's not my belief system, but that's how things are structured right now, right? And so um, it matters if someone who is articulated as a theoretical physicist or big word astrophysicist rocket scientist is getting up and saying, the Mayan people don't exist anymore. Um, you know, it, it matters um, how we are using language to articulate things. It matters that, um, you know, quark physics became articulated as colored physics because 
they wanted to create a, a scenario where you have a, a neutral color charge at the end. So um, they were happy to have red, blue, and green because they add up to white and white is neutral. Um, and, and so, you know, I think people might say to themselves, well, I don't see the connection between um, physics and all of these other issues um, because, you know, gravity is gravity. It's gonna happen, you know, whether we exist or not. But at the end of the day, the language that we are using is both communicating to people who take physics classes, but also there's a whole industry that banks on the public's excitement about the cosmos um, to um, you know, manufacture interest in Jeff Bezos writing his thing into the upper atmosphere. I'm just gonna put it like that. Um, and, and, and so, you know, language and science are, are connected very intimately and ultimately math is also a language. And so I, I want, if nothing else, big takeaway, I want people to walk away thinking that scientists don't exist outside of this conversation, but are very much in this conversation. Even those of us who are doing what is called the hard sciences. Thank you. I keep forgetting I'm on camera because you guys keep saying that that's dropping my face and I'm like, that's not a great look. But this was, um, we're coming to the closing and this was incredible. Um, thank you guys so much. I want to do kind of one last go around to folks and um, allow you to share you know, your final thoughts. Like right now, as we're closing this panel for each of you, what's what's sitting on your mind what's sitting on your heart what are you left with thinking about and also um please share where folks can find you because i know folks want to find you after this so Otto, can i can i kick it to you to lead us off oh, you're on mute this is very eye-opening i've learned so much just by uh, participating here and listening i'm so happy uh, that I was invited. The, I think that uh, people who have a tremendous passion to, to change the world and, and provide more equality and more justice, uh, have, we have not looked, at least I had not looked, at the librarians who have been doing such tremendous work uh, uh, and that there's so much that can be done. I think this is an extraordinarily important thing to, uh, to hear and uh, anything that we can do to promote that move will, uh, uh, whether it's technological, as uh, Rinku said, uh, by providing, by putting ourselves, uh, by uh, becoming engaged uh, monetarily to be part of the production of knowledge uh, and also the, const the construction of books or um, software and all to promote and, and, and produce materials and ideas. That is extremely important. Um, I think that we need to, uh, that what is important here for me is to realize that uh, although I've been looking for 20 years at mass media, at the newspapers, at televisions and so forth, that there was this entire new uh, institutional universe that had to be addressed. The darkness, the film on the darkness students who led the charge, the issues with Chanda and, and her efforts to make, uh, to uh, uh, be, have the representation that, that she wants, that she is best suited to uh, speak to is something that I think we really need to be considering. Uh, Particularly in this, I'm going to limit it to the libraries. I think that's a big enough problem uh, in the library system we have here. I have to repeat again, uh, it's the direction that when children walk into schools, they are confronted, they learn a system from their elementary school teachers that have been taught with a system that obviously needs reconsideration. I hope that uh, that uh, and I have a lot of faith in technology to uh, ameliorate the limitations that we have within the card catalog system, which I, I still use the term card catalog. 
since I was educated in the last century. But um, it takes people with values at the head uh, uh, of these institutions to make the changes. And it takes young people who are willing to put time and energy in organizing to lead the charge to push their elders and push the leaders to make those changes. That's what I've come away with. This focus is very, very huge for me. Um, and I'm grateful that I had an opportunity to participate. Thank you. And where can folks find you? Uh, I will put it, my email on, uh, I'm on, I'm uh, retired. And so I will put my email uh, out there for you guys on the chat. Beautiful. So? Um, yeah, so um, I think what I would like um, the audience to take away is, um, you know, as active library users to, you know, look at your uh, closest library and uh, talk to the library staff and be more involved and, um, you know, demand for those things that you know would benefit you would benefit your community. Um, some libraries are really good about listening and um, they wanna hear from you. So that is really, you know, what I, I wanna say um, is to advocate for your library and, um, and report anything that you, you know, think should be changed even as you're taking a look at, you know, the library catalog record, um, there might be something that you think, um, you know, could be updated. Um, my contact information, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and add it to the chat. Perfect. Uh, you can, I can also um, share the link to um, one of the webinars um, that I know was, uh, impactful for bringing about change on replacing the I word in library catalogs. So I'm happy to do that as well. And thank you all for, yeah, for being here tonight. Um, it's an honor and thank you to the Brooklyn uh, Public Library for inviting me. Chanda. So in the last like two weeks, I've done multiple library talks and um, I want to shout out the librarians at Ohio County Public Library in West Virginia. Um, when they were introducing me, um, they mentioned that they were going to have an entomologist talking to people about bugs. And I just want to remind people that libraries um, and archives more broadly are this incredible resource. They're an important public resource that um, the public has to support and use. Um, and it's not just about books, it's not just about papers, it is about um, all of the things about our culture that we find of interest and want to preserve and want to learn about. Um, libraries are sometimes the only place where people access the internet, um, et cetera. And so I, I think that, you know, there are problems. And this is, in, in, in my, in my view, a point of tough love. If there are things that need to be changed, it has to be done with a love for what libraries and archives can do for us. Um, and I think that, you know, on, going in the opposite direction, I think that, for example, those of us who are scientists or those of us who are science fan boys, girls, envies, um, can learn a lot from thinking about what it means to be in service to the public good, because I think that librarians and archivists have thought about that quite a bit. And there's something that we have to learn there. And so um, I would like to encourage people to think about, um, you know, asking scientists, like, what's your relationship to the archive? What's your relationship? I particularly actually would like to see physicists challenged with this question, um, because, I think the typical understanding is that we don't have a relationship to the, the archive in, in the traditional sense. And I would like us to be pushed on that point. And so I will just say, you know, we depend on the public for our funding. So ask us questions. 
Thank you. I know we're like at time, but I don't want to close us out without uh, Rinku. So please take us home before I kick it back to Lee. Uh, if you try to change the language of anything, many people will tell you that it doesn't matter, but it absolutely does. And you can stick to your commitment um, to the language that describes you the best um, to begin with, as well as all the other people and phenomena of the world. And there are more fights in front of us. You know, we need to be calling people who are coming out of prison returning citizens instead of, uh, you know, labeling them by, by the crime uh, for the rest of their lives. Um, we, I, I really love the movement to change, uh, to stop saying slave and say enslaved people instead. There's a whole power analysis embedded in that change. Um, I'd love to work on that. So if, and now I wanna organize librarians for all sorts of things. So uh, I put my contact info into the chat if anybody uh, wants to learn or throw ideas around or um, pursue any of this, these things, we are always here. Thank you. My honor to be uh, your moderator. You guys were fantastic. Follow these people. Lee, I'm kicking it to you to say goodbye. Thank you so much, Brandy. Um, I'm Lee Hurwitz from BPL's Alternative Classification Committee. Um, and on behalf of all of the committee members, I just wanted to thank all of you, Chanda, Rinku, Otto, and Sol for giving us so much food for thought. This conversation exceeded my wildest imaginings. Um, and I wish it could go on forever. Um, and I also wanna thank Brandy for guiding this conversation. Um, this program was recorded and it will be posted tomorrow on the Center for Brooklyn History's uh, YouTube channel. Uh, we'll be putting a link in the chat right now to that. And I also wanna mention that this coming Monday, July 26th, the Center for Brooklyn History will present Documenting Slavery, the Impact and Import of the Federal Writers Project Slave Narratives. Um, it's a conversation about the narratives of formerly enslaved people that were collected in the late 1930s as part of the WPA's Federal Writers Project. And we'll be welcoming Clint Smith and others to talk about that important historical documentation and what it means today. Um, and you can learn more about the program and register to attend by going to the link that uh, we'll put in the chat. Um, thank you all so much for coming and have a good night.